Shabbat Shalom and good evening and welcome to tonight's uh, Beit Rafa broadcast and service. I'm Rabbi Maurice Sklar and uh, Beit Rafa means house of healing. And if you are in need of healing, this is a good place. I'm glad that you're uh, you're here tonight because um, our God is a healer. He is Yahweh Rapha, the Lord who heals. He sent his word and healed us and delivered us from all of our destructions. Um, tonight, uh, I, I want, <clears throat> the Lord had asked me when I started these that uh, he says, I want uh, one night a week for you to do a Jewish night. I said, okay, well, I don't know how to do that because really, uh, <laughs> show me how to do that. And well, so he's, he's, uh, it's been a journey and he's showing me what he wants me to do. And each one's a little different, but uh, our Friday night uh, uh, service is, is uh, we're going to look into the Jewish world uh, I'm playing actually, uh, this <laughs> isn't Jewish music today, but uh, this is uh, the last service I did uh, last night was uh, I was playing my recording of the Bach Sonatas and Partitas, so this is just the end of that. Um, so this is, so that's, I'm just going to let that finish up and then probably do some Jewish music. Um, and uh, <clears throat> of course, we were we were reading uh, the, those wonderful stories of Rabbi Shlomo Karlbach, who uh, was my wife Devorah's rabbi, uh, uh, right right up to the time, and then she had gotten saved through a uh, through a Sid Roth tape, believe it or not. And, but she was very deep into the the. Uh, the Orthodox Jewish world, and uh, when I met her, she opened up a, 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 a new realm to me of, of, of revelation into how beautiful the Old Covenant is, and, or as some people call it, the First Covenant. The, the Bible is a book of two covenants, and yes, I am a, what some people call a Messianic Jew, or Messianic Jewish believer, or I'm a Jew who believes in Yeshua, in Jesus, that he is the Messiah. And so, um, you know, for, for a long time we've, we've been separated, but <laughs> the time has come for, for Jew and Gentile to come together. And, and the Lord in my calling, uh, when he has supernaturally called me a number of years ago now, he said, I want you to... Uh, stand in the in the middle in both worlds and some people consider that impossible but um paul did it paul paul was the greatest example of the one new man in messiah that and uh and the truth is that god has treasures in both groups of people and we need each other you know even the different denominations of in the christian church uh, instead of looking at it like uh, I'm right and you're wrong, let's we need instead to understand that the Lord didn't give all of Himself to just one group of people. Now I do draw a line there, saying that uh, you know I don't believe there are many paths to God and ways to God, and that you know uh, the other religions actually offer redemption. No, there's only one redemption, and that's through the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, Yeshua the Messiah. And the Bible is uh, the infallible Word of God, but it is also a Jewish book, and it's an eternal Jewish book. And I, I've said many times to uh, Christians, you know, uh, people that uh, I've said um, <clears throat> some things uh, go through the cross and they are fulfilled and they pass away. Some things uh, continue, like the promises of God, the, 
the prophecies, uh, the, the future of Israel, the Jewish people, those are eternal and covenant. God made with Abraham and his family is an eternal thing. And have to remember that Yeshua, Jesus, is a Jew. And I say is because he is uh, not only a Jewish man, but he is, uh, he, God became a Jewish man forever uh, because he, uh, he, uh, Yeshua, Jesus, was not only, he's not only the son of God and the, and, and the eternal, eternal, he is deity, uh, but he is, he is the word of God, but he's also, he's also the king of the Jews, the son of David, and in his humanity, he was able to come down where we were. Man had fallen and was without hope, without God, but God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but receive eternal life, which is a free gift of grace. <clears throat> so what God has done in the new covenant, which is a better covenant and based on better promises, what does that mean? That means that uh, the promise is not just to the Jewish people, not just to the the natural family of Jacob, but is now whosoever will believe on the finished work of what uh, uh, Jesus the Messiah has done for us when he rose from the dead, he paid the price for our eternal redemption. And so, hallelujah, the, the, the whole world uh, was then, uh, it, it was expanded. So this, this uh, and we're saved through a simple, we, we receive a new birth spiritually through a simple childlike faith in the work of our Messiah, what we could not do for ourselves. Nevertheless, there are some things that remain and some things yet to come that pass through into the new covenant. And those things are in the process of being fulfilled uh, including the physical restoration of the nation of Israel. And the, of course, that involves the Aliyah, or the return of my people from the ends of the earth all the way back to, to our ancient homeland. That has begun um, and would signal, according to the prophets, that would signal uh, the time when God has uh, brought us out of exile and and it is a prelude to the coming kingdom. So God, uh, uh, God is restoring the Davidic kingdom, but it's also the Messianic kingdom. The Messianic kingdom is uh, what the church uh, calls and what we call uh, the, the, the uh, appearing and the coming, the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. Well, he's coming back not as uh, the Gentile God, but he's coming back as the Jewish king, the king of the restored nation of Israel. And out of that kingship comes forth also, of course, he is king of the earth, the king of glory, according to Psalm 24. He is, who is this king of glory? He's the soon coming king. So uh, it's important that we understand God means what he says in the Bible. Uh, if, he, if he writes names like Benjamin and Issachar and you know Jerusalem and, and all of these places and names and people groups and he, he's talking to them, uh, that's who he's, he means what he says. He's not talking to another group, except through the, uh, through the, uh, it goes first to the Jew and then into the nations and into the church. So the, the church partakes of the promises God made 
uh, to Abraham and his descendants, it doesn't negate just because the other nations have done that. It doesn't, it doesn't replace the original promise. It, it just includes, it includes. Um, just like if you say our justice, new justice, Amy uh, Coney Barrett, our Supreme Court justice, praise God for her. Well, uh, her family has five natural born children, but she also adopted, she and her husband adopted, their family adopted two children. One was from Haiti, and I don't remember where the other one is from, but uh, they, 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 uh, from outside of their family, but they became children just as if they were naturally born. Nevertheless, they came into that family from outside. Well, that's the image, that's the, uh, the way Paul describes this grafting in that, that has taken place. So the Lord is in, pro in the process now of fulfilling his promise in the earth to his, uh, the firstborn. Uh, the Bible calls Israel, says Israel is my firstborn. He says that to Pharaoh, he's, uh, through Moses, he says it to a number of times. It's the firstborn uh, in the sense that, uh, and, and through, and even it says through the fall of natural Israel, the temporary uh, fall, through that came the redemption of the entire world. How much more will their restoration be but resurrection life? Or So these two, these two even including what, I call the grand finale, which is the name the Lord gave me, because I don't have, I don't, you, some people call it the, the, the great awakening, the third great awakening in America, the, 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 the great uh, last, you know, burst of glory that comes into the earth to bring in the harvest of the church age and to fulfill the Great Commission that everyone shall hear and God's going to show himself good in the earth, <laughs> that he is good to all and his mercy endures forever. So we're in, a, we're in a very exciting time, but we're also in a time of travail because uh, the, the nations, in a, if you can look at it as uh, birth pangs or travail, we have a big fight. Uh, the kingdom of darkness is fighting everything. Satan and his fallen angels and, and demons are fighting to stop this grand finale. But you're going to see a crashing and burning, if you will, at least in the short run, concerning the um, and I like what uh, our brother, he's Jewish, I didn't realize. I was listening to him recently, Lance Wallnow, the prophet. Uh, he is a prophet and he's a specially equipped, uh, specially equipped prophet too because he's very, very knowledgeable and he's a student of politics, current events, and is, is just, anyway. But he, he, he uh, he's, he's Jewish. I, he's a, I, I didn't even realize, Wallnow is a Jewish name, but... Still, uh, the uh, I think it's Polish. I'm not quite sure, but uh, <clears throat> the, the the thing about it is he he's talking about the same thing, and he he has a book that actually uh, I'm interested in in getting. It's I, I want to download it. I haven't done so yet, but it's called the uh, uh, the Chaos Code. He's just released it. Um, uh, what's going on right now? And and uh, he has said that he's predicted this whole political situation that we're in right now. He wrote it uh, a couple years before. And, and God's prophets are rising up in a powerful, powerful way and an unusual level of agreement, and which, which tells me that either we're all right or we're all wrong. But there's no... Uh, it's, Anybody that I respect in the spirit, including men that are not prophets, there's an apostle that uh, who is actually not 
given to these. I mean, Pat Robertson, a man responsible for uh, certainly over a hundred million souls coming into the it, to faith over his, through his ministry. I mean, you listen to people like that, you know. Uh, and he's, he said the Lord spoke to him. Well, he doesn't get up and say the Lord speaks to him every day, you know. I mean, it's one thing if... Uh, and he said to say he had a word that also parallels uh, exactly, actually, what the Lord has shown me over many years and shown a lot of other people about the, the, uh, the re-election of, of, of Donald Trump. And the uh, so there's some enormous uh, shifts <laughs> that are taking place right now at, through the judicial uh, realm that are, is going to bring about some uh, overturning. God said to me, He said, "I'm going to overturn the uh, all of this overturn, overturn, overturn." And He said, "I'm going to." I'm going to, it, it's good. And the picture is like, remember he said, Moab is my wash pot. <laughs> you know? It's like he's taking a dish and he just, it's filthy and he just turns it over and, and he, he, clean, he, he wipes it out, he cleanses it, turns it over and, and uh, it can no longer hold what it once held. It's a, it's a, it's a form of judgment. Actually, it's a severe chastening upon uh, what we call the left, uh, and uh, uh, this it's going to be a, a, a humiliating, embarrassing exposure that has just begun to take place, and it will build and build. And, and and the the thing about it, this corruption is, it's all, it's it's like one of those domino things that <laughs> some people build, you know, domino to you know. Uh, uh, once one falls, then it just goes right down the line, and um, so that's what I think we're we're about to see. And as we get into 2021, there's going to be a lot of surprises, and a lot of Christians who don't really believe; they just believe what thus saith the news, and uh, they're going to be very surprised. And uh, you know. You just watch. But anyway, that was not what I was going to uh, talk about right now. What I'd like to do this evening is um, to... <clears throat> I'm going to be introducing some uh, new books that... These are Jewish books, though. They're not, they're not ones that you would... Uh, you know, it's... This, our, the two worlds, the two universes, the beautiful... I, I see both of them as extremely valuable and uh, a part of God. Both, it's the world of the two covenants and, and that there's, there is a beauty and a move of the spirit. There's great wisdom. There's, there's uh, a tremendous... Uh, there, there's certain revelation that he's given to the, our people, Israel, that the church needs to complete herself. That doesn't mean that, you, you know, I'm not talking right now about doctrine or we all must be born again and be saved and receive Jesus. I know all that. But this is a time of restoration. See, when God makes us one, it's, it is directly connected with God restoring Israel back to himself. And uh, that's the Bible, that, that's the primary message of the Bible is, is the story of, of Israel and her redemption. And out of her redemption comes forth the redemption of the whole world. And so if you don't have an understanding of that, uh, there is a realm of glory that the church has missed. And what it is, uh, Paul called it, the. there's a glory of the old and there's a glory of the new. And it's not uh, the idea that, well, because we have the new, we don't need the glory of the old anymore. No, it's, it's adding, it's like, well, you, you, need, you need the foundation of a building to get your penthouse uh, apartment in the sky, you know. 
that you can't have one without the other. And not only that, but there is great, uh, there's great joy to God's heart when the, na the firstborn natural children and the adopted come together and we recognize we're, we're brothers and sisters. We're part of the same family. And that is also a sign showing how close Mashiach, Messiah, is to coming. So anyway, <clears throat> that's really the, the grand sweep of the Bible, what, what it talks about. But we've, we've been so fragmented and mainly, I, I call it being myopic. We just see our little world and we don't understand how big God is and how he's moving and uh, he, how, and he's always watching over his word to perform it. And if you, anyone who believes his word, which any cover, I mean, even if it's a begat, you know, so-and-so begat so-and-so. Yeah. If you have any faith at all in God's word, the Lord, uh, sees and recognizes that well there are many many uh, and have been devout uh, uh, holy uh, holy men and women in uh, in the Jewish world that are a whole lot closer to God than you might are some Christians might think and instead of it's not a matter of of replacing or com it's a matter of completing each other so I don't know why I'm talking so much about that, but maybe someone needed to hear that. Um, now, uh, whoops, I didn't mean to turn that off. Oh, no, I didn't. Okay. Um, <clears throat> anyway, let's look now uh, at uh, to this week's parasha, or the portion of Scripture in the, from the Torah that, that our people uh, read and study and we have a chronological way of doing it. We, the readings divided over the year, the first five books called the Torah of Moses. And, and today we are, uh, the title of today, uh, tonight we start the, the parasha, which is called Vayetze, which is, uh, and he went out <laughs> and he went out yeah that's the the well, here so I'll, I'll tell you here um let's listen to this and he went out excuse me just a minute here okay here we go Last week's parasha, Toldot, told how Jacob had successfully supplanted his twin brother Esau by obtaining the blessing as the heir of the chosen family. However, since Esau had threatened to annul the decree <coughs> by means of murder, if necessary, Jacob fled from for Haran, to stay with his uncle Laban until things would cool off. <laughs> uh, this week's parasha begins with Jacob's flight from his childhood home in Beersheba to Haran. It begins... Okay, let me do that again. In the Hebrew, that is from Genesis 28.10, it says, Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. Now, Haran was the, uh, the, the ancestral home of Abraham, uh, Ter is where he grew up. Right? So while Jacob was on the way to Haran, he came to, quote, a certain place, which is Bamkom, <laughs> Bamkom, there for the night. Using a stone for a pillow, he dreamt of a ladder, Sulam, that was set on the earth, 
that reach to the heavens with the angels of God, Malachi Elohim, ascending and descending upon it. Then the Lord himself, Yahweh, stood above the ladder and promised Jacob that his offspring would be like the dust of the earth and that through him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. When he awoke from his dream, Jacob was awestruck and called the place the house of God, or Beit Elohim, and the gate of heaven, Sha'ar Hashamayim. The following morning, he took the stone he used as a pillow, anointed it with oil, and consecrated the place as Bethel or Bethel, Bethel. Then he made a vow, Neder, that if the Lord would be with him, providing for his needs, until he returned home to Beersheba, he would tithe to God one tenth of all of his possessions, and would return to worship and pray at the altar he had just consecrated. When he finally reached Haran, Jacob encountered some shepherds who were gathering their sheep at the local well. After inquiring about the welfare of his uncle Laban and discussing their method of watering the sheep, he saw his beautiful cousin Rachel, Rachel, bringing her father's flock to the well. Jacob immediately, or Rivka actually is her name, he, he told her that he was her cousin, her father's sister's son, Jacob, who had come from the land of Canaan. Rachel then ran home and told her father Laban, who invited him to stay with him. <clears throat> Jacob had immediately fallen in love with his cousin Rachel and eagerly agreed to work as Laban's shepherd for seven years in order to marry her. After the seven years elapsed, however, Laban supplanted Jacob's desire by swapping his eldest daughter Leah for Rachel on the very wedding night. Most likely she was veiled, uh, you know, according to the, the, the Jewish wedding tradition, and so he, he could not recognize her. A deception Jacob later discovered the next morning. Presumably, <laughs> presumably Jacob was a bit intoxicated. <laughs> Maybe that's the case with the previous evening's festivities to not notice the switch. I, I, you know that that's. I don't understand that. I, but you know, after all, Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. That's a very. Uh, good old King James way of describing uh, uh, describing it. After protesting to Laban, Jacob was allowed to marry Rachel a week later, provided that he agreed to work seven more years for his dear father-in-law. Next comes the account of the birth of the 12 sons of Jacob, i.e. the 12 tribes of Israel. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved by Jacob, he opened her womb while her sister Rachel remained childless. Leah gave birth to Jacob's first four sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. When Rachel realized that she was barren, she followed her great-grandmother Sarah's example and offered her... <laughs> her handmaiden, Bilhah, to be a surrogate wife. Bilhah then bore Jacob's next two sons, Dan and Naphtali. There's a whole lot of sex going on here. My goodness. In the madness of this sibling rivalry, Leah thought she had stopped being able to bear children, so she gave her handmaid, Zilpah, to Jacob as a surrogate wife. Zilpah then bore two sons, Gad and Asher. However, Leah was not finished with her childbearing, after all, and gave birth to two more sons, Issachar and Zebulun. Finally, the Lord remembered Rachel's prayers 
and she gave birth to a son, Joseph. She also gave birth, finally, to Benjamin, but that account is given in next week's parasha. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, now, here's uh, the sons. See, the, uh, all names in the Bible have meaning, and they mean something. So the sons of Jacob are listed here. Uh, Reuben, the firstborn, Reuben means see, a son. <laughs> Simeon is hearing or heard, or God heard my prayer. Simeon, he hear. Levi means joined to or attached. Judah is praise or praised, or I will praise him. Dan, a judge. Naphtali, or Naphtali, wrestling. Gad, Troop or company. Asher, happy. I like that name, Asher. Nice name. If I, you know what? If I'd ever have a son, I'd probably name him Asher. I like that name so much. If I have another son, I should say. Issachar, there is no, there is recompense. Zebulun, exalted, honored. Joseph, may he add. Benjamin, son of the right hand. Hallelujah. So that's the... Now, after Joseph was born, Jacob wanted to return to Beersheba to see his parents and to settle back in the promised land. However, Laban persuaded him to remain, offering him sheep in exchange for his labor. Despite his father-in-law's repeated attempts to cheat him, Jacob nevertheless prospered since... God was with him. After six more years of service, Jacob received a vision from the Lord telling him it was time to return to the land promised to his descendants. Now everything about this, uh, the, the, everything about the covenant of Abraham is directly connected to the land for, uh, for, for the Jewish people. It, it and, you know, there is, I mean, I'm talking about the real estate, the actual promised land God promised Abraham. There is a, there is a tremendous connection between the land, the blessing, the people, and the destiny. All of that is all wrapped up in the same, uh, uh, same promise that God gave of, of blessing uh, Abraham. <clears throat> All right, so um, he, after six more years of service, Jacob received a vision from the Lord telling him it was time to return to the land. After discussing the matter with Rachel and Leah, Jacob, decide to, Jacob decided to flee from the clutches of Laban while he was away shearing sheep, since by this point it was apparent that his father-in-law never would never would let him live in peace. You know, I just want to say something about that. You know, there's something called, uh, uh, well, there was a book uh, I read, I have it, uh, it's another, it's a book of Jewish history, History of the Jews, it's called by Solomon Herzl or Solomon Grazel, Gra Gra Grazel, that's right. And it was a book written in the 50s probably, uh, but it it really outlines what he he calls the curse of anti-Semitism, and uh, the th we see this begin. It's a demonic hatred for the covenant covenant people of of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. As soon as the promise was given to Abraham, uh, there was con there was jealousy, there was conflict. And there was a constant attempt uh, from that point on throughout the last 4,000 years to, <clears throat> to, uh, to destroy the, the, the covenant promise that God gave and to uh, a jealousy to try to usurp it. Uh, we see it in Abraham when they, when, you know, uh, uh, Abraham and uh, what was it, Lot, how Lot went with him, and how there was a 
was the land couldn't stay, you know. So there was a there was contention always about the blessing would come, then jealousy would rise, and then. But this man Solomon Grazel, in his book, a big old thick paperback book, excellent book. But um, so it, he he talks about what what it actually is the curse of anti-Semitism, and I read a, I wrote about that in my book, um, the book uh, Revelations for the Midnight Hour on uh, what about the Jews and and and, and this type of thing. <clears throat> is God done with them and you know are we finished what what's what's going on here um <clears throat> and uh this uh curse of anti-semitism uh, was repeated then with Isaac Isaac and and the Philistines I think I think that was a group or whoever it was with the, one of the enemies uh there in in the land of Canaan would fight over water because there was a drought and famine and and Isaac had an anointing to dig wells and find water and he just kept he had to keep and they would fight over the well and then they fight over the next well and, and uh to the point where there in the the sages comment on that in the in the writings down through history that the the idea of uh, okay the, you can have the well but the water is ours. In other words, trying to take the blessing and steal it, and 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 so this this constant battle uh, has gone on. And of course, Jacob, we see it again through Laban, who changes wages ten times and 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 kept stealing, kept stealing the water from the well, if you will, until finally God separated him and said, "Go back to your land." Well, this is this. Uh, uh, Mr. Grazel said this this curse of anti-Semitism, which we know, of course, as 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 believers, we know it is demonic in origin. It's it's satanic. It's a satanic hatred assignment to destroy uh, uh, destroy God's plan for Abraham and his descendants. Well, so uh, so we know it's not people because every different people group had the same thing happen. Uh, it's repeated. This is it became a cycle. I mean, and we see it all through the Bible. We see this. Uh, we see this. This almost irrational uh, type of, of of behavior, uh, and it never stopped. It just kept going down through biblical history, then down through. Uh, uh, also, uh, you know, down through Christian history as well. I mean, we just until this very day. Uh, so, what is it? It's this: the 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 statement is, "You are not fit to live among us as Jews." That's what he wrote. Now, this was probably written shortly after the Holocaust in the 1950s. So. Of course, that was the worst of it all. I mean, that was the worst genocide. Uh, but uh, the uh, and then he 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 shows this through history how this curse, when it started, was you're not fit to live among us. Every time it starts as Jews, so the first attempt is to okay stop being Jewish, be like one of us. And then you can live among us. And then, if that the only way to stop this 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 cyclical curse is through the church and prayer and through uh, God's intervention in a society. I mean, we it, because uh, this is this is this is an undercurrent that has always been there. Some people believe, some Christians believe, they don't say it to me, but I know they think it. Well, you know, he's too obsessed with that and he's got a root of bitter, bitter root or something. No, actually not. I, I have to stand for this. I'm not, I don't hold anything against anybody, but I'm very aware that this is, is uh, an undercurrent within the church. It still exists today and uh, it'll pop up. It'll pop up if it's not, you have to deliberately, uh, you have to bind that demonic spirit or, or that's this thing 
occurs again. So they say, well, stop being Jewish, then you can be like as a Christian or whatever. Stop, okay, stop your religious behavior and uh, become like us and you can live among us. Well, if that isn't, if that is not spiritually bound and broken, then Satan takes takes another chunk off that sentence and that's uh, you're not fit to live among us. <laughs> so not it doesn't matter if just because you're you can't live among us. So well, then this happens. This is what this is the pattern. The cycle they come we come in from wherever we were uh, wherever we were in exile. I'm talking about especially during the diaspora. Uh, wherever whatever last country or place we were in and it we we usually have come in destitute we've come in or not destitute you know but everything was stolen from us well within two generations or three generations if you just leave the jews alone uh they'll end up rising up to the top of that culture and society and begin to uh rule it in the same way uh it's the blessing of Abraham, which is there. It's just there. So it's through different means they they end up they end up rising this uh, up in every realm of uh, we as as Mr. Walnell says about the mountains of influence. They end up somehow uh, owning uh, owning the. They they end up and it looks like well you stole this is what happened to Jacob that's what I'm talking about Laban uh, no matter what he did Jacob ended up <laughs> with more and that is a pattern and and yet there was this constant battle for uh, uh, un, un, of this curse of, of anti-Semitism so so then if that's not stopped now if there's a revival or something that can be stopped because uh, the first thing that happens when when you're born again, I'm talking about the Christian time now, but if a society is influenced by God in some way, uh, there is a, uh, then then there will be a, the, the other side of that leverage is this, you bless, see, God told uh, Abraham, those who bless you, I will bless, those who curse you, I will curse. So, <laughs> that's a leveraged, you know, they they talk about a leveraged stock. You know, God's, it's like a test. <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> uh, you know, but it's going to, it's going to be magnified, whatever it is. So this is an important thing to understand. God has tested the nations of the world. In fact, he even in, divides them in the last days, according to sheep and goat nations. Those who, of course, embrace God, but those how you respond to Israel uh, is uh, has enormous uh, enormous weight, and and it's an over. There is something that that is a, a, a universal, or it goes beyond time. It's like doesn't matter what covenant you're in. It's just that's there. The blessing of Abraham, the blessing and the curse are there. So uh, it's a test. It's a, what. Uh, you Christian nations down through the last 2,000 years, what have you done with my people when they sojourned among you? You know, uh, I was a stranger. You let me, you know, uh, I was in prison. I was sick. I was, well, actually the primary meaning of that parable, even though it is really also dealing with spiritual conditions and meeting the needs, that's Jesus in disguise, yes. But it's actually referring to also the end time uh, national judgments. What are you going to do with the Jews that are in your midst? What are you going to do with them? And uh, so, <clears throat> as you know, some nations have done better than others. <laughs> um, so anyway, this is something that we uh, we have to understand as as we get into this the last of the last days where we are right now we're experiencing a shift oh i let me finish that that sentence of 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 mr grazel's says he says so then if that's not stopped and i'd say stopped through 
he would think of it as, you know, social, uh, you know, goodness or, you know, somehow stopping the evil. Well, you stop the evil in the spirit because Satan's the author. Of it, so you have to bind the devil. It's the devil that's bringing this. Okay, so, but if it's not stopped, then finally, the 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 worst part of 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 this cycle is you're not fit to live, and it's shortened from into just those few words, and that is the end result. And of course, uh, Satan is the one who kills, steals, and destroys. So he's after the destruction. Why? Because God said in Jeremiah, He said, if you can wipe out the Jew from off the face of the earth then uh, I'll annul my covenant with heaven and earth. And and uh, Satan could actually take the throne of God on that. Uh, but it's not going to happen. Empires have come and gone. We're still here. See, and when you begin to think like that, you begin to understand God made covenant with America and with uh, our the founders, those that uh, dedicated this land. He's made covenant and he has a purpose. That's why I'm so certain that we can't fall into communism because we won't fulfill God's... Uh, this is this is a, a, an, an attempt to illegitimately usurp our government. Um, I don't think so. In fact, I know... I know that, uh, and because it is so severe, the judgment's going to be very severe. And, you know, but you don't want to sit there and laugh in glee. You want to help these poor, desperate, broken humanists that are lost like a goose in the snowstorm. So we have to start praying for the Democrats because it's the demise of their party. It's a complete uh, uh, exposure and... Uh, and 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 there's no there's zero integrity there the whole thing is built on lies so there's no more trust so no one will vote so uh they're finished well it doesn't look like that well just stick around a little while longer you'll see but i'm actually trying to do this here let's let's go on just before the flight from haran rachel stole his father's idols perhaps intending to cause him bad luck. Three days later, Laban discovered that Jacob had fled. He gathered his men and pursued him, finally catching up to him seven days later at the mountains of Gilad. However, the Lord appeared to him in a dream and warned him not to try to influence Jacob to return to Haran. Laban then rebuked his sons-in-law for having left by stealth and accused him of stealing his idols. A lot of accusing going on. <clears throat> Jacob denied the accusation and unwittingly proclaimed that the real thief would die. A prophecy, wow, I never saw that. A prophecy that was later to be fulfilled with the premature death of Rachel. I, did, I never saw that before. Wow. Wow. Uh, this is a commentary uh, from Hebrew for Christians, which is excellent. I really like it. After searching through Jacob's possessions, which proved fruitless since Rachel had carefully hidden the idols, Jacob was able to finally give his evil father, father-in-law a piece of his mind. These 20 years I have been in your house. By the way, this is a picture of, uh, uh, this is a prophetic snapshot picture parable, if you will, of Jacob is a picture of Israel in the nations here, uh, or the diaspora, or the, the exile, how we've been treated uh, for the last 2,000 years. It says here, these 20 years I have been in your house. I served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flock, and you have changed my wages 10 times. This is this is tyranny, no liberty. Uh, if the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been on my side, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God saw my affliction, 
and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. Laban and Jacob then parted after making a peace treaty attested to by a pile of stones. Laban, see, everybody's, it, when, when they lose uh, against Israel, they always want to make a covenant, you see. Well, okay, because why? Because otherwise uh, they lose everything. They, they think, oh, well, I got to guard my stuff, you know, and, and, and that's not the, that's the way you receive a blessing from God is to is to give, not to t to hold on. But that's the just the way the devil thinks and makes the world think. Jacob then got on his way back to the land of Canaan, where he was met by angels from God. When he saw the angels, he exclaimed, "This is God's camp," and called the name of the place Machat Naim, or two camps uh there's a parallel there the the the, uh, the two camps um this is also referred to in the song of solomon and it, it has some deep uh hidden meanings i don't have time to go into that right now but uh, uh the the angelic realm and the two camps so the the parasha ends with jacob sending messengers before him to his brother Esau in the land of Edom, explaining that he was returning to his homeland after his long sojourn in Haran. Okay, so that's the that's the summary there. But there's a lot of drama going on. But do you notice do you notice the nearly the full the full head of the monster of anti Semitism has already risen up? And this is these are his family relatives. Well, some of us have just been through being with our relatives uh, yeah, yesterday. Some are still around. Maybe they're still. <laughs> and very often our families are not the most uh, uh, cordial to each other, which is kind of sad. But this you talk about. And I think Jacob was a very dysfunctional father and husband. I mean, he, he didn't, I don't think he knew how to, and, and plus, my God, I, one woman is enough. Can you imagine having two of them? Two, two Jewish women? Oh, no, 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 you don't want that. One's enough. Please, I, poor Jacob. No wonder he worked so hard. <laughs> he was out in the field all the time. <laughs> You know, uh, all right. So, another thing that's interesting is often in the prophets, you'll see the name Jacob and Israel interchanged at different times. And, and the Lord uh, showed me that when Jacob is named, when God calls Israel Jacob, that's, that's when they're in the flesh. But when he finally, when he, when he finally prevailed, uh, that's in next week's I think, Parasha. But uh, when he finally prevailed with the angel, uh, then God changed his name and it says the sun rose upon Israel, prince prevailing, prince with God. So so Israel is, he changed his name because he changed. It's the covenant promise uh, being fulfilled. And so God didn't take the, the, the one that was the most altogether. He's just like the church. He takes the real, the real messes and makes them champions. And then he gets all the glory because if God can do that through somebody like that, then there must be a God. <laughs> you know? And that's what God likes to do, doesn't he? takes the least of these and makes them into his his uh, trophies. So, amen. Well, praise the Lord. So now, uh, <clears throat> I want to, since we finished our Shlomo book, I've, I want to introduce you to a few books and then I'm going to decide what I'm going to, we're going to read because I love to read. You know that. I love books. I love to read. Um, <clears throat> but these are some uh, this is a book that actually I found. Uh, remember, uh, Shlomo Karlbach was uh, this this very, he was a Zadik. He was probably one of the greatest uh, 
holy Jewish men that walked with God, certainly in the middle of the 20th century, and maybe, I mean, he goes, but he was a disciple, he was, he was mentored, let's put it that way. He was, God mentored him. He, he didn't just come out of nowhere. He, he was a musician, a psalmist. He wrote a lot of songs and beautiful. We still sing them today. But, um, <clears throat> and Devorah, you know what? Just served him day and night. Just took care of him. Brought him around. Uh, did his, you know, took care of, uh, took, uh, watched his children. And he went to Miami Beach. He, he, he was, she was just a, what we call a schleffer. Not a schleffer, but a, a helper. And, and, uh, but he was one of these gray hidden men. Uh, the Zadokim, the, the righteous ones that God has uh, anointed. There was something, a very special man uh, that God had touched. And so, but he had some mentors. And uh, his, the greatest, his, real, really his mentor was uh, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. Now he was the, he was, one or two, I think two generations away from the Baal Shem Tov, who was the founder of, of the greatest founder, where well, there are several of them, but he was the, of Hasidic Judaism, in the, in the Ashkenazi world of the Pale of Russia and Eastern Europe. And, uh, now, of course, uh, those were the story. The stories that I read to you, most of them came from uh, Reb Nachman. Uh, most of them came from uh, stories that came back. You know, in the uh, he was he lived in the Napoleonic times. You know, this was the beginning of what eighteen hundreds, seventeen eighteen hundreds, right? Right in again, right the first part of the eighteen hundreds, I think. And uh, <clears throat> but. It was one of these extraordinary, uh, extraordinary men that changed his world. Well, he had disciples or Talmudim, okay, and uh, there was one man that was. He just went around and wrote down everything that Rev Nachman said, and his his was uh, his his name was Noson Noson, uh, and he he wrote down prayers and. I have several books of, of writings. Uh, this one here uh, is, uh, is written by Rev Nosson of Breslov, who was uh, before Shlomo, but he wrote down, he was a scribe, so he wrote down uh, everything. I mean, and these are books of prayers. It's called The Flame of the Heart. It's a prayers of a Hasidic mystic. And some of these men, great men, I mean, they lived in heaven more than they lived on earth. Well, I don't believe in that. Well, there's a, yeah, there is a, uh, you know, when you think, when you hear of Kabbalah, you hear, uh, you think of Madonna, which is, <laughs> is not really what Kabbalah is. But it, there is a, there is a, there is some of that type of witchcraft and stuff that gets attached to uh, some of that. But really, uh, what it actually is, is uh, the move of the Holy Spirit in the first covenant. That's what it is. It's God visiting these men that they, uh, all they did all day long was study Torah and pray. I mean, that's all they did. And uh, many of the... Uh, the followers of these great men uh, now are most of the ultra-Orthodox world, you know, that go around with the strimals on the, and, the, and the, you know, and the, the zitzit and the, and the curls and the, you know, the very observant. And there's different sects because they follow different rabbis. Well, this, this particular, this man, is something else. I, that's all I can tell you. And I began reading this. This book is, this is a, a book that uh, Devorah found it somewhere. But um, it's, it's what Shlomo taught all the time. He was a very loving man. 
Revi, Revi Nachman says the teachings of Rabbi Nachman of Breslau as taught by Rabbi Shlomo Karlbach. Now, this, I would say instead of, this isn't the gospel and it isn't the word of God and all that, you know, Christians get very nervous when you get them outside of their little religious box. They get very nervous and they shouldn't because uh, God is a great big God. <laughs> uh, so, <clears throat> Anyway, uh, you could call this the wisdom of, of, of this, great, this great rabbi sage. And so I'm, I'm going to start, because that's where all those stories came from. <laughs> that's what I'm trying to tell you. So we may start on that. I want to show you a few books, though, that if you're really... This book right here, I have a story about this book, okay? This I got in Israel. Before you think I'm some... Uh, crazy, um, um, you know, familiar spirits and all that. I no, I, I spent. I just read to you Kenneth Hagin's in him scriptures. Come on, I I'm not trying to mix anything up. I'm just oh, you know what? Bless your darling heart. I pray you grow up. <laughs> God's big enough to keep me, and He's going to keep you too. So anyway, uh, this book here, this book actually, I started praying through these prayers again. Same thing happened to me. This is a, there's only two books that, other than, of course, the Bible is the greatest, but uh, two books that I read that I've had to stop reading because the glory was too strong. I just couldn't handle it. This is one of them. I have a story of something that happened to me. This book is called The 50th Gate. These are the prayers of Rabbi Noson, or from uh, uh, Nachman. Uh, he was the, the, the main disciple. Uh, this book uh, has prayers of consecration that are so deep and so, I mean, it, and they're, they're in Hebrew, but they're, they're in English too. And just reading it in English is just, and, and I, it, I mean, you talk about conviction. As only, I could only go so far before I say, Lord, I, I'm not ready for that. I, I can't even, I, I can, I, this man is in some realms I have not, I'm not, I don't think I've grown enough. I know that sounds funny. I don't mean it in a religious, weird way. I mean it in a sense of... <clears throat> anyway, this book is called The 50th Gate. I got this in a... the uh, Devorah, We were up in Galilee, uh, in, in northern Israel there, you know, near Tiberias. And we were, we were staying there because this was... Uh, we were there in those days, about 10 years. I used to go to Tom Hess's conference every year. Uh, who was a great uh, lover of of Zionism and Israel, and he'd had a, he has a big com convocation, uh, th several thousand people from all over the world, and they come. and I was playing uh, and ministering uh, for for that for 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 ten years. Uh, God sent me, and it was and it was during the High Holy Days every year. So we would go, uh, we would go. So we were there anyway. I think we were. We had a few free days. It was right around Yom Kippur. Uh, Devorah said, "You should go. We should go see this town, Svat. It's called it Svat. S, yes, S V F A T. Svat. <laughs> uh, this this little town is up in the kind of up in the hills and the mountains, and it was built by the Spanish." Jews, the Moranos, they call them, who escaped uh, from the Inquisition time, and and uh, they were there. That's the other branch of the Jewish world, the Sephardic. Uh, and we went and we just visited the town, and I said, "There's something different about this. Something different here." And I, re I, they, they said, "Well, it is the it. This is the place where." the uh many of these mystics came from where they lived these mystics of of uh and where 
the Kabbalah and all that, uh, you know, started. Well, of course, we say that and people get nervous. I'm not talking about crazy, demonic, uh, deceiving spirits right now. And there were some there. I, I know that. I know that. And I they camp on the very outside of... It's like there's a pure stream... There's a pure stream, even in the first covenant, of, of, of uh, supernatural visitations by God, uh, visions, revelations. Uh, God has always spoken to his people, uh, even in the, old, in the old covenant. And, uh, and this, but there, there was something that I, I experienced that day, so I need to tell you about that. So I was... Uh, <clears throat> Now in these days, and I we this was gosh, it's fifteen fifteen years ago. Yeah, two thousand started coming there in two thousand and five, two thousand six. So this was quite a few years ago, and I really wasn't very comfortable with the Jewish. I mean, I I just knew there was something about Devora that it was a different well in her spirit that was so deep, but it wasn't the Christian well, it was it was something else. And it drew me, it drew me back into my roots in a, uh, in a powerful way. And yet I could never put my finger on it. Oh yeah, that's that, that's a familiar spirit. No, it's not. It's actually, <laughs> it's, the whole, it's the Holy Spirit, but he manifested to the Jews. It's just a move of the Holy Spirit in, God, God, don't you think God can visit his people if he wants to and take them into heaven? And, uh, this, these, some of these guys, they prayed in tongues. They, 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 I, I don't understand it. I'm not, I, I'm, anyway, I'm stretching some of you and some of you are uncomfortable and about to turn, a few of you about to turn me off. Well, bless your darling heart. I'm, uh, if I'm deceived, I sure ask God to keep me. And uh, where we'd all be deceived, but for his grace. So don't, don't, no. This is what happened to me. I'm supposed to tell you. There's this very special synagogue there. And uh, Devorah said, just come in here. I said, okay. So came in and uh, it was beautiful synagogue. It's like none other I've ever seen. It had light blue walls, very high ceilings, a Sephardic different kind of it had a it uh, the uh the the bema and the uh the the uh, like we would call a pulpit uh, where they have the torah and everything it was in the center and it was uh, but i walked in and immediately i said this is this is so holy this is so awesome and I sat down, and I'm just, and there were plaques on the walls, different, different, uh, and they were all in Hebrew, you know, they, they were, they, and, and then I realized these, these great men had come in here, these rabbis, and for, for centuries, several centuries, you know, they, in their whole life, they prayed here. And so I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there, and suddenly I knew it was the presence of the Father. It wasn't what we call the anointing in the sense of, uh, you know, thank God in the church, we have the presence of Jesus, the presence of Messiah. And of course he is God and a God, yes. But this was different. This was, this was the, this is Father, God. And I sat down and I knew he was, I mean, I just knew God showed up, you know. And he was there. And I heard I heard the Lord speak. I thought it was audible. I wasn't sure, but probably inside of me. Uh, there were a few other people in the room, you know, so they didn't hear anything. So this is what I heard this. The Father said to me, Your Jewishness is precious to me. That's what I heard. Those words. And I said, okay, wow. And I was wrestling with this because the Lord had called me at that time to, uh, I was getting ready. I guess it was probably 2007, 2008 because I was getting ready to 
uh, uh, prepare to do the uh, Hebrew Melodies recording. So the Lord was pulling me into some of these areas so that I could understand them because I didn't grow up in this. <clears throat> but my fathers did, my forefathers did. Uh, so, so there I am, and I'm, I'm, and suddenly, I began to hear, I began to hear the walls started to speak, and out of the, out of these plaques, you know, the prayers and the, the different, I started hearing the prayers, I started hearing the prayers of all those for the last 500 years or so that had been there praying those prayers. And as they were praying, I, I, I just was overwhelmed with the, the, the holiness of God. He was so holy. And yet, it was not a Christian, it not, was not a church sense. It was, it was a very, very, uh, it was, it was the, I can't even say it in English, but it was awesome. It's just an awesome, this is the Shekinah glory of God filled that place, filled me. And I was changed. I never, and I didn't actually see a vision there. I heard, I heard, I heard. It's what I heard. And after that, I began to realize, wow, there's, there's a whole lot that I don't know about. Because I knew it, one thing I knew, this isn't a, an occult thing, this is not a, this is not, because I was, I was on my guard actually, because I heard Kabbalah, and I'm thinking like you, Madonna, you know, or witchcraft, or, and that's not what the, these men, these men were, were, were just seeking God and God visited this the Lord visited this little community in a special way and he just hovers over it so like he hovers over it and uh, <clears throat> now of course there's there's there are people that come in there and try to you know that, that don't have the right spirit and that's sort what of, I'm not talking about that I'm talking about that was God I knew one thing for sure that's God that isn't some devil masquerading as God. That's something, this is real. And then uh, we went out and we were walking around and we went into the bookstore and Devorah said, look at this. I said, what's that? It's called the 50th Gate. And so she got this for me. And there were actually two volumes, so I think she ordered the other one. Uh, this is how long ago it was and that's how far I got. I started praying, I, I, I did, and I, I had to put it down. I said, this is, this, there's only two books like, there's a Christian book that does that to me too. And it's written by Mariah Woodworth Etter. It's called A Diary of Signs and Wonders. That book, uh, the glory gets too strong and I can't keep reading it. I, I just, I, I, I just, I've only partially, there's, oh no, there was another book. I forgot about that, yes. There was another book years ago in uh, the early 90s I read, which I have down there, and I don't think I've opened it since because it scared me. <laughs> not scared me, but it, it fear of God. I just, I'm not ready for that. It was a, a book called Intercessor by Reese Howells. Same thing. This overwhelming sense, it just got, I said, I'm not ready to go in that deep. I wasn't able to do it. And I'm growing to the place now where, you, you know, where I can do this more. And, and I don't know if I'm, God's going to let me. But anyway, I want to tell you about it at least. This is, this book, and it's all about your heart and humility and consecration and, 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 and judging yourself. And it, it's, it's really, this was the same time the holiness movement, and this is like, this is like the John, John Wesley has writings like that too in the in a parallel uh, time in the church. Uh, 
of, of you know, the laver. Remember I told you about the laver? Wash yourself, be clean. Well, this is what this is. It's, it's like a, it's not anything spooky. It's not that. It's just, there's a level of consecration. And I tell you what, in now that we're getting into this grand finale, uh, I was reading it today and again, I was swept into that place where I said, that's all I can take now. But I read for about 20 minutes. I prayed. I just prayed the prayers, you know. Here. Am I allowed to do that, Lord? You want me to? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, here I am. This is, uh, this is just the, the, the Hebrew on one side. And then listen to this. Love and fear of God. Our Father in heaven, it is from you that all the living have their share of life. Living God, our portion and our rock, save us from death, redeem us from destruction. Keep me and all your people, the house of Israel, from all kinds of evil thoughts and doubts. They are called the side of death. In your abundant love and kindness, grant me life. Let me live a life that is truly good, long and eternal. Help me sanctify my mind, the wellspring of living waters. Bring me to love and cherish your great name with a true love that will rise up to you directly. Unify my heart to love and fear your name. Save me from fallen fears so that I will have no fear of anything in the world besides you. Let your fear be on my face so that I will never sin. Help me pray to you with all my strength. Let me put all my energy into the words of the prayers and bring forth the sounds and words with great force. Let my voice penetrate my mind and resound in my heart like thunder, inspiring my heart to your service. Now, as I read this, it opens vision up to me. I, I start seeing it, and then I, it takes me there. And I don't understand that, but it, 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 it takes me into the words. Let the thunder of my voice and words bring me to genuine fear of heaven so that my words will be a resounding influence, drawing myself and others to serve and fear you. Let the voice of our prayers rise and find favor before you, like the seven voices which King David cried out over the water. The voice of Hashem is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. Hashem is upon the vast waters. The voice of Hashem is in power. Let the crookedness of my heart be smoothed out completely. The stubbornness of my heart will depart. I will not know evil. Bring me to be truly pure-hearted and let me always face God honestly. I was, I started praying it because I said, oh, you know, because I, and the Lord started me, I was thinking about Svat, and then I was like, oh yeah, that book, oh, oh, that book, <laughs> oh, that book. So I, I was reading for three minutes and I'm swept in, I'm swept into this place, but it is, it's a heavenly, it's like a, it's a heavenly synagogue. It, I, I, That's as far as I can go. The Lord won't let me go any farther with that. Okay. That's enough, he says. Okay. See, I don't understand that, but you can only, you can't share. Well, Sister Gwen said that. She said, some things you have to learn to keep God's secrets. Uh, keep God's secrets. If you, he tells his friends his secrets. And that's what a prophet is supposed to be, a friend of God, a friend. Are you best friends? He'll share things with you. He says, 
He says, there's a name written that he'll give you and nobody else. It's a hidden stone. It's a hidden thing. They're hidden things. Mm. And I'm not exalting myself or anything. I'm just saying that anyway, this is, uh, this is something special. And this comes out of the Jewish world, you see? So be, be careful. Be careful with just really walk softly with that realm of judgment. You just don't know. You know, I, I have a friend of mine, bless her heart, you know, who who tends to, she doesn't like any any charismatic or any kind of people very much like that. But she's charismatic herself, but she's so scared, you know. And, and she's... Uh, And she'll she'll kind of orbit around me for a little while and then run away. <laughs> and then oh, you know, you're and then she has condemned some people that I'm under, that God put me under, you know, they oh, they're false prophets and I tell you, just you know what? You don't have to you don't have to you're not judge and jury. You really aren't. Um uh, just you don't have to do that. That doesn't mean you no, there is course a false prophet there's only been one time i've had to one time i've had to break fellowship with someone and that was a false teacher false prophet they had really crossed the line now it doesn't mean they're not there i just don't associate with them uh i just if i hear something wrong i just turn it off that's all um, anyway if there's a counterfeit there has to be a genuine and God has promised us that if we seek him with all our heart, we'll find him. That's Jeremiah. And uh, Jesus said, if you're really looking for the Holy Spirit, God's, God the Father's promise us he's not going to give you a serpent or a false. If your heart is right, uh, the Lord will find you. And he's, he's seeking after those. He's more interested in you knowing him than you're knowing he he wants to share himself. He wants to be your friend. He wants to take you up into heavenly places and visions. And I tell you what, I live more there now than I do here. <laughs> I do. I'm, it's happening more and more every day now. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that I'm. I'm not trying to conjure anything. No, that's the wrong kingdom. I don't talk to the dead. Uh, there's no dead in heaven. They're all alive. <laughs> I talk to the living. Oh, you're trying to talk to the no, mm -mm. Mm -mm. but I've talked to, uh, I've been able to, to uh, the Lord shown me. He said, uh, uh, my really great ones are in other generations. And I said, wow, really? <laughs> and he's let me, let me uh, be with a few of them, and surprisingly, some of them are rabbis. Oh yeah. Even in the martyrs, even in the hall of martyrs, the greatest crown I saw wasn't even a Christian one, Christian so-called. It was. So my heroes switch generations. I actually, I like things. I'm an old, <laughs> old school. <laughs> Someone said, you're old school. Well, I know, but I tell you something. That doesn't mean God doesn't have them now. He's got great ones hidden every, but the, all the really great ones, when the when the wickedness is so the, the real, the God will hide His glory. He always hides His glory. He always hides it somewhere. And you'll, if you don't have the right heart, you'll walk right past it. You'll never, never recognize. You just won't. You just you got to ask God to put that eye salve on you so you can see. You can see, you can see the anointing. See, and God, God's great ones are in disguise. You just, just, just can't, you never know. It's like a box of chocolates. <laughs> you never know what you're going to God will come to you in some package that you just, that just rubs you the wrong way. And yet that's God right there. That's Jesus coming to you. You better, how do you, how are you treating Jesus when he comes to you? 
in disguise in the least of these. How are you treating the anointed one? Yeah. Hmm. Anyway, so this book is... A, a, I'm going to start getting into it again. I mean, it's like I take... I. Uh, this is the experience I have when I start reading this. Uh, it's like taking the elevator up. Well, it says 50th gate, I think. It, it's like, shoo, you just shoot right up. They, he said there were 50 levels. I, this man was praying these things from heavenly places. And yet, we wouldn't even say, well, he's not even saved. How do you know? <laughs> He believed in Messiah a whole lot more than you do. He just didn't know he just didn't know who he was. That's easy. Jesus shows up, says, Oh, I'm the Messiah. He says, Oh, so it really is you. <laughs> Go straight to heaven. That's it. That's how easy it is. They believe. Many people believe that you many people are gonna be in heaven you never thought would be there, and a whole lot of people that you thought will be in heaven, aren't there, too. I um, mean, you're going to be in for some shocks, 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 because you think you know everything and you don't know anything, especially about the hearts of men. We don't know. That's why God said, leave the judging to me. You just love. Love everybody. Love everybody. Love everybody. Love one another. That's it. That's it. You don't have to do anything else. Just... Love thinks the best of, you know, love is the fulfillment of Torah. Love is, love, that's all. Jesus said the new commandment, love God, love people. That's it. And, 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 but there's this place of crying for purity. And I believe that's the cry of the bride. The bride that's being prepared for this hour. It's a purifying spirit. People say, what's the next move? What's the next move of God? You know, and they're all... <sighs> the first thing you have to learn is how to approach a holy God <laughs> uh, and how to, to stay close to Him. You, you, have to, you have to learn what it is to reverence God. And that's like, what? What does that mean? I don't have time to go into that right now. <clears throat> anyway, this book is a this one is the sayings of Reb Nachman, and so we're gonna we're gonna look at. I'm just gonna kind of wait on the Lord to see what exactly where I've I've spoken a lot. I'm kind of just introducing them tonight, I guess, because uh, we don't have a lot. Uh, wow, a lot of time's gone by, but I am gonna read something to you tonight because I love to read to you. <laughs> I hope that's all right. <laughs> Uh, uh, glory to God. Uh, <clears throat> now, this one, I had a very strong witness about today. God said, go get this one. I said, okay. This is a, a book in uh, our library. It might have actually originally been in Devorah's because I didn't have this book. But I knew of him. I knew of this man through my father. This is a book called, it's a big book, called Jewish Literacy. There. Is that, I said backwards, Jewish Literacy, by Rabbi Joseph Telushkin. Now, he is, uh, he's alive. He's a, a he's a, a modern, uh, modern uh, writer, very, very uh, observant Jew. And he's, he, he had a real burden to, to write, let's see, because a lot of, uh, a lot of modern Jewish people are the baby boomers and us, and we're just, especially American Jews, <clears throat> a lot of us don't know God from a hole in the wall. You know, we just don't know anything. We're just secular and just out there. And But you see, a lot, especially Jews, they're very hungry for the supernatural and God because they're hungry for God. And so, you know, every one of these cults, we moved out to California. I got to tell you a story. Very funny story. Can I tell you a story? I'll tell you a story. <laughs> no, this happened to me. This is probably 12, 13 years ago too, about around that same time. I was uh, 
somehow. Oh no, I, I ministered in this uh, black church uh, in inner city Los Angeles, like Compton type area. You know, I don't know, I don't know what it was, where it was. It was a, and uh, you know, it was a lot of fun. I mean, it was amazing. I love ministering. It was kind of, mm -hmm, you know, I love it. So I was in there and I played or and I, I ministered and and they were jumping up and down and excited. And, well, the pastor uh, invited me. He he was friends with the uh, sheriff of Los Angeles at that time. He was a Hispanic man, he was Catholic, um, Baca, Sheriff Baca, that was his name. Really sweet guy, uh, very, uh, and anyway, he, he, he said, well, he has this interfaith prayer breakfast that's meeting in a, a high school gym somewhere in, a, in, in L.A. <clears throat> well, we were, we were living in, in then the high desert up an uh, hour or two away, but we, we drove down there, and I was so grumpy. Oh, I was so awful. I didn't want to go. I knew what it was going to be like. I mean, we got in there, and that gymnasium was filled infested with demons i mean it was just it was just the very air you could hardly breathe and and <clears throat> the coming in and out of people and i mean it was and every focaccia religion you could possibly imagine was there uh <clears throat> <clears throat> the mormons were the waiters or the they waited on the table uh the jehovah's witnesses had a table the uh, there was a table with Baha Baha'i ladies, which were all backslidden black Pentecostals, I think, but they were Baha'i ladies, and they were they were uh, you know they had their their white thing and then their head, and then <clears throat> there was uh, there was different religions you can never hear. I mean, the Hare Krishnas were there. Everybody was there, and. <clears throat> And I sat there, and you know, I ate. It was, I ate breakfast. I was tired. I didn't. I don't like the mornings anyway. And I was just, why did you bring me here? I don't want to be here. Get me out of here. Okay, so, no, 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 no. So there I am, and uh, <clears throat> that's why I have Devora. She keeps me steady when I don't want to do something. Glory to God. So. Um, Finally, we're there at two hours, and every focaccia, really, and, and every one of these guys and girls, uh, nearly every one of the really crazy religions, like the religion of sound and light, and Ankara, and New Age uh, goddess of Zohar, or something, not Zohar, I don't know, Zo Zoltan, or whatever, I don't know. All of these crazy, crazy, and every one of these guys, Every one of them, you know, Berkowitz, uh, Leibowitz, uh, Stern, Hirsch, uh, Hirschenbaum, and they're they're heading up all these, all these crazy, New Age, Eastern, uh, everything you, a lot you never thought of, and they're all Jewish. I said, "What are you Jewish? What are you?" Doing? And nobody was. There wasn't. I don't think there was one. I don't know if there was a Christian in there or not. I or a Jew. And I was supposed to. I finally they put me on. I came last. I was. I and you know, I mean, finally they they got me on. And there were Hollywood people there. Shaka Khan and Elfman lady Elfman. Somebody Elfman was on some show, and she was a pretty blonde girl. She got up and. Uh, how we all have to be together and sing Kumbaya and you know, all this or whatever. And we're all group hug. And I wanted to, I just wanted to vomit. It was just awful. So there I am. And I finally, I get up. I said, God, I'm just going to play. And I'm going to get this over with. I had two songs I'm going to play. I played, uh, I played Jewish folk medley. An amazing grace. <laughs> that way, I, I, so then, then the, the everybody got felt better. They they covered finally, they covered the Jew and the the Jews and the Christians. Okay, so, but this is what happened. 
I started to play, and by then, I was in torment. I mean, all those devils, it was awful. I just said, get me out of here. I didn't say anything. I just played. I just got up, and, you know, I said, announced the song. And, you know, I, I always wear a yarmulke, so I add it on when I'm playing. So, <clears throat> and uh, everybody's clinking. They're, they're done, and they're all talking, and nobody's paying attention, really. And I'm, you know, and so, well, I'm, uh, yes, I'm, uh, I'm here to represent the Jews and the Christians. Nobody even paid attention. A couple looked up uh, people, but that's it. And then I started to play. And uh, the track started, and right, because it was an introduction, and right before I come in, I, I don't know how to describe it, except it was like a nuclear bomb went off in that gymnasium in the spirit. It just, boom! And every single devil left, just left. That's the power of, an, sometimes God can do that as he, as his spirit wills with music. <laughs> it's a weapon. Well, so there I am, and God knows I was far from man of faith, and I didn't just get me home. I don't want to be here. Oh. So then I, I play, and and suddenly, in about 20 seconds, all the Baha'i ladies that were at the table, you know, these, these, they're supposed to be, I think they were all black Pentecostals. I, they must have been. Because they jumped up all together. And everybody joined hands and started doing the hora. Everybody, the whole place, started dancing like this, you know, dun da hava nagila, you know, and they're all clapping and, oh, you know, and then they're doing, you know, they're trying to dance Jewish or whatever, right? Everybody, and and they they weren't even listening to me. So this bomb went off, what, even before I started to play, it was the Holy Spirit did that. And every devil just, just catapulted out of there. And and God just showed up. I believe this is this realm of glory that's coming into the earth, I'm telling you, right now. Uh, when God shows up like that, <laughs> you should forget it. I, I don't, that's one of the strongest manifestations I've ever seen, ever. And it had nothing to do with me, for sure. <clears throat> Other than I just happened to finally somehow managed to have enough strength to start. That was it. So by the end of the song, they're all dancing, the whole place. I mean, even the Hollywood table in the front with the sheriff and they were, Shaka Khan was leading them and everybody was, the Baha'i ladies were shouting, hallelujah, hallelujah, you know, like this. <laughs> and the, the, the Mormons were, were, you know, they were trying to, even they were trying to dance, and they, they all put their trays down, and, you know, <laughs> they all had these black name tags and suits and stuff, you know. And, and then there was a Scientology table, and even the Scientology table got up, and they were dancing. All right, so then, <clears throat> then uh, I didn't know what to think. I said, well, praise the Lord. Um, well, I, I'm, 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 a Christian as well. This you you all know this hymn, and this is Amazing Grace. And they all started cheering, and I mean the whole time. And and they were they were crying and shouting and singing. The whole place just erupted. That's you know that's what has to happen in our whole country right now, and it's going to. Uh, you're going to see some these kind of victories. And uh, I'm telling you, I'm very excited. This grand finale is going to not be like anything you've ever seen before in the earth. And we have nothing to compare it to. But if God can do that in that gymnasium in uh, South LA or wherever it was, in, in the, he can... He can do anything, and he—that's the truth. He can. He's going to do things that 
in this hour that is just going to, and God, God's just going to show up, you know, <laughs> like that. And then there's no debate about it and no more Ankara and, and Mr. Berkowitz was singing and so was Mrs., you know, Mrs. Stein and whatever, Bernstein and all the Jews, they're hungry for what? The glory of God. We're all hungry for it. <clears throat> That's the living God. That's the most high God. Hallelujah. That's what happened when Elijah called down fire on these crazy prophets of Baal. God can do it, and he's going to. So how did I get over into that story? It's a testimony. That happened. All right, so anyway, this book, Jewish Literacy, let me tell you a little bit about it, and I think I'm going to read, <clears throat> I'm going to read a little from here, and I might, I might, I think I just might do this, because this book <clears throat> is, was written for really the, a Jewish person who has an interest in God, but knows nothing about his heritage, and, and, and this just, this is a great book, and uh, and it goes through the Bible and it explains and and but I like the way and sometimes you would think well if they take Jesus out then it's not then it's not. they don't take Jesus out they just that he's just he's just always in the background <laughs> you know it it's not that he's out it's it's that they it's just this is truth as far as they know but. I'm telling you, it's beautiful. It's beautiful writing, and, and he is, uh, anyway, so I'm going to read this to you. It basically, he said, uh, this is, most Jews, he calls it Jewish illiteracy. They, they're they just these secular Jews, just a blank slate, like all the, uh, you know, people just don't know God. They, 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 and, and we've got to return. We have to, first of all, get a revelation that God is there and then and, and, and he is the God of the scripture. All right, so I'm going to read this introduction and and we'll receive communion this evening, the Kiddush and communion. Okay, so <coughs> okay, Jewish literacy I'm sorry, Jewish literacy by Rabbi Joseph Telushkin. All these books, now this book you can get. Uh, these other ones I'm not sure. <coughs> uh, at a time when Jewish life in the United States is flourishing, Jewish ignorance is too. Tens if not hundreds of thousands of teenage and adult Jews are seeking Jewish involvements, even Jewish leadership positions all the while hoping no one will find out their unhappy little secret. They are Jewishly illiterate. The most basic terms in Judaism, the most significant facts in Jewish history and contemporary Jewish life are either vaguely familiar or unknown to most modern Jews. They can tell you the three components of the Trinity but have an infinitely harder time explaining mitzvah. They know what happened to Columbus in 1492, but not what momentous event shattered the whole Jewish world that year. <clears throat> Over the past 15 years, he wrote this in 1991, I think, so back a ways. <clears throat> Over the past 15 years, during which I have lectured in more than 300 Jewish communities, in over 30 states, I have grown increasingly aware of the frustration many Jews feel that their ignorance, uh, sorry, I've grown increasingly aware of the frustration many Jews feel with their ignorance of basic Jewish terms. My audiences have run the gamut of Jewish life in America, Reform, Conservative, and Orthodox synagogue groups, by the way, the church needs to become Jewishly literate as well. The Orthodox synagogue groups 
Hadassah, UJA, Jewish Federations, Jewish Community Centers, and high school and college students. And despite the differences in beliefs <coughs> among these disparate audiences, on at least one issue, their need and desire is virtually identical, to have available a source of basic information about Judaism and Jewish life. People crave this. They are enticed by the knowledge that there is no law in the Ten Commandments that commands us not to kill, for example. The biblical verse reads, you shall not murder. And by the implications of this semantic difference for Judaism's attitude towards pacifism and capital punishment, they are challenged and fascinated to learn that the term mitzvah means commandment, not good deed. And to find out why the Talmud considers acts motivated by obligation to be on a higher plane than acts performed voluntarily. It is precisely to provide such a resource <clears throat> that I have devoted the last two and a half years to writing this book. But while Jewish literacy is intended, intended to be encyclopedic in scope, I have tried to make it read like a narrative work, not a reference book. Entries, therefore, are presented topic, topically, not alphabetically, so you can easily read through a whole section. For example, Bible or modern Jewish history, Jewish ethics, consecutively. For that reason as well, the writing style is anecdotal as much as factual. When you finish reading a chapter, I hope you will not only have understood a term's historical or ritual significance, but will also have a very good idea how the term is used in daily life. Jewish literacy lends itself to being used in one of two ways. As a study guide, one can read through section by section in order to acquire an overview of of Judaism and Jewish history, or as a reference book to which one can go to look up a specific term or event. The book, I hope, will also be of particular help to people studying for conversion to Judaism and to Jews who had never had a systematic Jewish education. Such people have often lamented to me that they feel ignorant of Jewish vocabulary, other Jews seem to possess, and yet they feel embarrassed to expose their ignorance by asking what a term or expression means. Two technical notes in the text. When an asterisk precedes a word, it means that the designated word is the subject of its own entry. Okay, yeah. Uh, so the Talmud says that words that come from the heart enter the heart. If some of the words in this book will touch your heart and stimulate you to go on expanding your own Jewish literacy, I will feel deeply blessed. Joseph Telushkin, New York, New York. Um, now, why? Now, sometimes the Christians say, "Well, why does that? What does that matter to me? Why do I need to know this? I'm not Jewish. I don't know." Because uh, you need to meet the other side of the family. That's why. You need, and uh, it will greatly enrich your life. And like I've said before, I'm a bridge person. God called me to go right down the middle. The hardest thing about being a bridge is everybody walks over you to get to the other side. But that's okay. And uh, I'm going to... So this book actually starts out with... Uh, the Bible, so <laughs> that's good. So we go through the Bible. We're gonna it goes through the Bible and then through history. So um, Tanakh, chapter one. I'll just read the Torah, Navim, prophets, Kevutim or writings. Tanakh rhymes with Bach. <laughs> that's good. Is an acronym for the three categories of books that make up the Hebrew Bible: Torah. 
Navim, prophets, and Kevut, Kevutim, writings or history. Observant Jews do not commonly refer to the Hebrew Bible as the Old Testament. That is a Christian usage. The first five books of the Hebrew Bible comprise the Torah and are regarded as Judaism's central document. Along with the stories about the patriarchs and Moses and the exodus from Egypt, they contain 613 commandments, the backbone of all later Jewish law, actually all law in the world. <clears throat> in Hebrew, the five books are also called chumash, from the Hebrew word chamesh, or five. There's a, there's a casino near us called the Kumash. It's an Indian word, but I don't think it's referring to the... To the never mind. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I noticed that when we were driving up. I said, oh, a casino named after the Torah? I don't think so. <clears throat> According to Jewish tradition, the books were dictated to Moses by God somewhere sometime around 1220 BCE, shortly after the exodus from Egypt. In Hebrew, each book of the Torah is named after its first or second word, while the English names summarize the contents of the book. Thus, the first book of the Torah is called Genesis in English because its opening chapters tell the story of the creation of the world. In this one instance, the Hebrew name is very similar, since the Torah's opening word, Bereshit of Reshit, means in the beginning. In Hebrew, the Torah's second book is called Shmot, or Names, because its opening verse reads, Al Ye Shemot Benai Yisrael, and these are the names of the children of Israel. In English, the book is called Exodus because it tells the story of the liberation of the Jewish slaves from Egypt. Leon Uris wisely chose to call his novel Exodus rather than Names. That's a great book, by the way. Exodus uh, by Leon Uris, a book written in the 50s about the founding of the nation of Israel, one of the great, great historical novels of the 20th century. I think it is. He wrote some others too. <clears throat> it, the Torah's third book, Leviticus, or Vayikra in Hebrew, delineates many of the laws concerning animal sacrifices and other temple rituals, which were supervised by the Israelite tribe of Levites. <clears throat> the fourth book, Numbers, Ba Midvar in Hebrew, is named for the census of Israelites that is carried out early in the book. It also tells the story of Korach's rebellion against Moses' leadership, or Korah. The final book of the Torah is Deuteronomy, Divarim in Hebrew. Virtually, the entire book consists of Moses' farewell address to the Israelites as they prepare to cross over to the promised land. He knows that he will not be permitted to enter it, but before he dies, he imparts his last thoughts to the nation he has founded. The second category of biblical books is the Neveim, 21 books that trace Jewish history and the history of monotheism from the time of Moses' death and the Israelites' entrance into Canaan around 1200 BCE to the period after the Babylonians destroying the first temple and the ensuing exile of Jews from Jerusalem to Babylon in 586 BCE. The early books of the Nevi'im, Joshua, Judges, and 1 Samuel, uh, and First and Second Kings are written in a narrative style and remain among the most dramatic and vivid histories that any civilization has produced. These books are sometimes referred to as the early prophets. 
The later books, written in poetic form, are what we commonly think of when, we, when referring to the prophetic books of the Bible. They primarily consist of condemnations of, to, of Israelite betrayals of monotheism's ideals, or, or idolatry, and of calls for ethical behavior. Here you find non-stop ruminations about evil, suffering, and sin. In English, the primary meaning of prophet is one who predicts the future. However, the corresponding Hebrew word navi means spokesman for God. The final books of the Tanakh are known as the Ketuvim and have little in common. Some are historical, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, for example, which is one book in the Jewish uh, Tanakh, uh, <clears throat> tell the story of the Jews' return to Israel following Babylonian exile, while First and Second Chronicles provide an overview of Jewish history. Ketuvim also contains Psalms, 150 poems, some transporting in their beauty about man's relationship to God. And we have read four of those five books, and tomorrow I'm going to be reading starting book five, I believe so. Another book, Job, grapples with the most fundamental challenge to religion. Why does a God who is good allow so much evil in the world? And uh, I can answer that real easy, because he has to. See, the trial of Job and the Odyssey. The Odyssey. The, in Ketuvim, he didn't write that. I just said that. I mean, the, uh, the part he has to. In Ketuvim are also found the five scrolls. Oh, my dad gave me a gift, a beautiful gift of this book, the five scrolls. Uh, it has calligraphy in it. One of the last things he gave me. It's beautiful. Which include perhaps the best known biblical works aside from Torah, Esther. The Hebrew Bible has been the most influential book in human history. Both Judaism and Christianity consider it to be one of their major religious texts, or really the, ma the, the major religious text. Several of its central ideas that there is one God over all mankind and one universal standard of morality that people are obligated to care for the poor, the widow, the orphan, and the stranger, <clears throat> that people should refrain from work one day a week and dedicate themselves to making that day holy, and that the Jews have been chosen by God to spread his message to the world, have transformed both how men and women have lived and how they have understood their existence. Even the last of the ideas just enumerated, Jewish, Jewish chosenness, has powerfully affected non-Jews. Indeed, the idea was so compelling that Christianity appropriated it, contending that the special covenant between God and a people had passed from the Jews, old Israel, to the church, new Israel. Islam, in turn, similarly insisted that Muhammad and his followers had become God's new messengers. The Bible influences the thought patterns of non-religious as well as religious people. <clears throat> the idea that human beings are responsible for each other, crystallized by Cain's infamous question, am I my brother's keeper? Genesis 4.9 has become part of the backbone of Western civilization. Our values in every area of life, even if we have never seen the inside of a synagogue or a church, <clears throat> are suffused with biblical concepts and image. We deride excessive materialists for, quote, worshiping the golden calf, unquote. Exodus 32, 4, and forgetting that, quote, man does not live by bread alone, unquote, Deuteronomy 8, 3, the appeal to a man's conscience can be like, quote, a voice crying in the wilderness, Isaiah 43, 
Pride goes before a fall, Proverbs sixteen eighteen warns us, while the cynical, jaded Ecclesiastes teaches there is nothing new under the sun. <clears throat> In daily speech, what a great writer, glory to God. In daily speech, when we refer to a plague, <clears throat> we are, of course, harking back to that famous series of ten plagues that struck ancient Egypt. The Bible is so basic to Jewish life <clears throat> that when I drew up a list of terms <clears throat> that make up basic Jewish literacy, almost 20% came from the Bible. And yet, as important as the Bible is, few people today read it. Even religious Jews generally restrict their reading of Tanakh to the Torah, the Psalms, and the Five Scrolls. Yet, without a knowledge of the basic textbook of Judaism, how can any person claim to be Jewishly literate? And then I'm going to just read, we're going to start uh, the, <clears throat> it's a short chapter here on Adam and Eve. We're starting uh, into the, into the uh, Torah now. Just to, And he has, but I love his writing. He's very, very... Uh, Lucid, it is excellent. Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden. The Torah's opening chapter describes God's creation of the world. Genesis's goal is not to give a textbook lesson in science, but to affirm that nature, with many people in the ancient world worshipped as a deity, was created by God. In general, the biblical view of creation is optimistic. Repeatedly, the Torah notes concerning God's creations, and God saw that it was good, which he mentions chapter 1, verse 10, verse 12, verse 18, verse 21, and verse 31. On the sixth day of creation, God creates the first person, Adam, Adam, whose name becomes the Hebrew word for human being. As John Milton noted, <clears throat> the first thing God ever specifies as being, quote, not good, quote, is Adam's solitude. It is not good for man to be alone, he says. I will make a helpmate for him. God puts Adam into a deep sleep, takes a rib. Actually, the Hebrew text is not really clear what it was from his body, <clears throat> and fashions from it the first woman, Eve. The very first of the Torah's 613 commandments is addressed to the couple, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and master it. Well, that's interesting translation, master it or subdue it, take dominion over it, take mastery over it. I like that. One twenty, Chapter 128, Adam and Eve, reside in paradise in a land known as the Garden of Eden. <clears throat> God provides all their needs, imposing but one prohibition on the couple. They are not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. <clears throat> the shrewd and strangely talkative serpent tells Eve, of course we know that is Satan, that if she eats from the tree, she will be as knowledgeable as God himself. God knows that as soon as you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. <clears throat> the first lie. After a slight hesitation, Eve's, Eve eats of the tree's fruit. There is no reason, by the way, to suppose that the fruit she eats is an apple. <laughs> yeah and then persuades Adam to eat from it as well. God is displeased. There was only one command he asked the couple to keep. The, the one thing in the universe denied to them, yet they were disobedient. His punishment is severe. Adam and Eve are exiled from Eden. They are fated to die, and God will no longer supply their needs. Adam must now earn his living by the sweat of his brow while Eve is to be subject to her husband's domination and will bring forth children in pain. While traditional Jewish commentaries condemn Eve's sin, the late 
Jewish educator Shlomo Barden offered a brilliant parable to explain her act of disobedience. Imagine, Barden taught, that a young woman marries a young man whose father is president of a large company. After the marriage, the father makes the son a vice president and gives him a large salary. But because he has no work experience, the father gives him no responsibilities. Every week, the young man draws a large check, but he has nothing to do. His wife soon realizes realizes that she is not married to a man, but to a boy, and that as long as her husband stays in his father's firm, he will always be a boy. So she forces him to quit his job, give up his security, go to another city, and start out on his own. Sounds like a Jewish wife. That, Barden concluded, is the reason Eve ate from the tree. <laughs> Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> in Christian theology, this story of disobedience became the original sin. It is the original sin, actually. <laughs> so, uh, with, with which all of mankind was permanently stained. But Jews have never regarded it with the same seriousness. It was an act of defiance, to be sure. And because it transgressed God's command, it was a sin. But the idea that every child is born damned for that sin is alien to Jewish thought. Not entirely, here's a Jewish person who believes that, because that is the truth. Despite the harsh sentence, Adam lives more than 900 years, and he and Eve's descendants eventually populate the entire world. Genesis' assertion that all mankind descend from this one couple is the basis for the biblical view that human beings of all races and religions are brothers and sisters. And as my uh, old pastor from years ago always said, and whenever I think of Adam and Eve, I always say it, you've heard me say it a number of times, God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. So, uh, hallelujah. Well, listen, I'm going to, that's just, uh, y'all tell me if you want me to continue. Otherwise, get, if you're, if you're a avid reader like I am, then uh, this is a great book because it'll give you also uh, a good uh, Jewish perspective uh, so you can understand. See, a lot of Christians want to witness to Jews. Of course, we go with want to get them saved. Well, all right. Yes, all of man needs to be saved. The gospel is for the Jew first, then, then the nations. Yes, we, we, we absolutely. But, but because we don't understand who the audience that we're bringing, you have to present the gospel in a different way in general to Jews than you do to just normal, you know, uh, Gentile people, even in the modern world, <clears throat> you have to understand where we came from, what what has happened in history, and and understanding the. I think one of the hardest things to get the church to understand, uh, in my experience, uh, being on this bridge for so long. I ask God, please, let me get on one side or the other so people don't walk all over me. <sighs> That's all right. One day. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, the, <laughs> what was I saying? Praise the Lord. The, uh, uh, the hardest thing to get the church to understand is what, chosenness is and means because it's a very hard thing it's a very hard thing to to share without I mean there's a lot of knee-jerk reactions that happen because of not understanding not really grasping what God meant and I don't have time to talk about that except 
this idea. I think that Telushkin, particularly, the, Joseph Telushkin is an amazing writer when he talks, especially when he talks about the, the, this area of chosenness. And he's brilliant in the way he, he's able to describe it. And he is definitely a Bible-believing Jewish man. I mean, he's a, no question. I mean, but, it, you know, it's not a, it's different than, I mean, you know, uh, I like, I also, I, I like E.W. Kenyon, and he's very Christian theology, and, and he's accurate as far as what happens spiritually. And there's a lot of revelation. We need the Holy Spirit. The, the, the point is we need both. That's the thing. And if you don't understand that, then you really don't understand the Jewishness of the Bible or God's plan. And you don't understand the first covenant and you don't understand chosenness. And therefore, you can't find your true place. What does it mean? What am I? Where, where, where do I fit in? You're a son, you're a daughter, but you're a part of a family. And God chose certain things <laughs> because he's God. So we don't always get to choose the place in our family. In other words, I didn't, uh, you know, if you're somebody's born first or born third or you, or if someone's adopted as an infant, well, you're still part of the family, but you came in a different way. And you, God loves making us all different. He likes diversity. He likes that. He likes us all. He has not made us all the same. There's not two people who are the same. So we we are we are uh, so unique, and God put us together in this way on purpose. And He likes it when we get along. <laughs> when we get along, then we start seeing God's glory manifest and even sometimes when we don't like that time in the gymnasium i mean god just just blew a bomb up in the spirit and drove all the devils out so they could could just just get over all their that's all a bunch of idolatry that's all it is and they're lost and they, they're hurt and broken and god at least they're looking at least they're looking i'd rather have somebody you know uh hold a flower in an orange robe in the airport uh, and say Hare Krishna Hare than somebody uh, who has no, doesn't even care. At least that person's searching. He's, just, he's, he's really trying. He's trying. He's, he knows he needs something. So people that are on the fringe so-called of society are very often closer to God. And the more broken people usually are far closer to God than those who think they got it all together. And uh, so, praise the Lord. <laughs> I want to wish you Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> this was a different night, and I'm, I'm just really searching out which way to go and what God wants me to do. So, um, I did the best I could with the leadings I received tonight, and We'll see what will join me next far, Friday for our Jewish night and we'll, uh, our Shabbat time. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's receive uh, the communion before we go. And I'm going to put on, uh, I'm going to put on, I like, let's see. Here we go. Um, on some how about how about that one okay praise the Lord I hope you got something out of that <laughs> praise the Lord let's see yeah it was 2008 we did the Hebrew Melodies CD so why don't I it was around the same time I had that experience. Uh, and the Lord actually for a season brought me into even the Orthodox prayers. He, I, he, he the Holy Spirit led me. He said, uh, we att uh, attended some Lub Lubavitch services and I would get up in the morning and the, the, we have this big, it's called a sitter, not a sitter, but a sitter with two D. It's a Jewish prayer book in the Lubavitch or the, the, uh, the Chabad, you know, they have this blue one, and you know, 
And I, I don't know how to do just a little bit of anything. So I'm, I'm doing the morning prayer and I start at the beginning and I go for five hours and I still haven't finished the morning service I was, because I did every single thing in there. And, oh, no, you're not supposed to do every single thing. You just, oh, we just read this and, and you know, or we just do this part. And then, Why? Because they do it every single morning, three times a day. Hallelujah. Like Daniel prayed three times a day in that good old-fashioned way. <laughs> you know, Jewish prayers three times a day. Well, they don't do every single thing in the book. So there I am, and it's I finally come out at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. I go, got up at 7 or 8 in the morning, and I said, I still, I can't do it. And Deborah laughs at me. He said, you're not supposed to do the whole thing. <laughs> I said, well, but God led me to, you know, I just did the whole thing. Uh, and and uh, so, you know, it is a religion, I understand, but it's full of God's word, and I love God's word. And I most of all want to consecrate myself. I love, oh, I want to go. If it makes God happy, I'll do it. I'll run around the block or, or you know, wear twinkled toes. I don't care what it is. I mean, if it makes, if, if I love him, I want to make him happy. Um, and then he's just happy because... He's just happy because he's just happy. He's just very happy all the time. And he loves me just because he loves me. I understand that. But but the Lord was helping me to get a revelation at that time of the, the world of our fathers, the world of my fathers, which was very foreign to me. But that vision, excuse me, that vision, though, that happened in the synagogue changed my life because I realized there was a whole lot I didn't know. And I'm even more convinced of that 12 years later, 13 years later, yeah. This song is uh, Raisins and Almonds. It's uh, from the Yiddish theater. You can listen to that if you want, just for a second. We'll, and then we'll receive communion.
I'm going to play, play one more for you. And this one really has the, the cry of uh, the Jewish, the Russian Jewish uh, neshama, they call it, the spirit or the soul, the Jewish soul. <clears throat> this is called <clears throat> Hebrew Melody. And uh, I just want you to listen. The Lord has to, he's actually extending, I'm ready to take communion, but he, he said, I want you to just listen to this. I hope you can hear okay. <clears throat> this is a very mystical. It comes out of the. It comes out of the same uh, world. Uh, the, the, this mystical Hasidic uh, uh, nigun is called. It's called a nigun. A nigun is a a. It's like singing in the spirit during prayers. The Jewish prayers, like in the. In the Christian world, we, we sing in the spirit, we sing spontaneously. Well, uh, Jews do that too. And in Russia, particularly in the, in the pale, where, where my, my parents and grand, my great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents came from, <clears throat> and who knows, <laughs> from, uh, there, they, each one, each one of these little shtetls or these little Jewish, were like ghettos, actually, they were, they were, uh, the, they were uh, uh, <clears throat> the they would have a unique uh, spiritual melody. It was just a melody that uh, <clears throat> is called a nigun. Nigun is uh, uh, niguna. Nigun is a a sung like like a. <speaking in Hebrew> it would come spontaneously during. Uh, the davening or the prayer, and <clears throat> and a rabbi would would, and then it would be something that would identify an actual uh, one of the uh, you know the the geography there, the the that particular shtetl, or uh, and so some of these became very famous. Well, <clears throat> there was a, a composer that actually he came to Hollywood uh, in the. Uh, gosh, shortly after he was in the St. Petersburg Conservatory, there was a movement of nationalism in composition and music <clears throat> around the, the turn of the century, and you know, and and so there was uh, everybody was last century, not this one. I mean, eighteen hundreds, nineteen hundreds, and so <clears throat> there was a, a particular sound of the Russian Jewish violin that had a cry in it. And uh, one of the greatest of that <clears throat> genre was uh, that came over from Russia uh, in the early part of the 1900s was a man named Misha Elman. Well, he was, he, he played this and Yasha Heifetz played this. Is, this was a very popular, <clears throat> uh, and it, it, it's, it, it was based on a nigun that uh, Joseph Akron had heard growing up in his synagogue, or his father sang it, or his grandfather sang it. We didn't, and so he made this melody. It's called Hebrew melody into this, and then it just goes up into a mist, into the uh, you know, it's like ascending up into heaven. And I actually played this. <clears throat> in uh, 2003, 2004, in at the Jewish Theological Seminary for Zaman Molotek. Uh, we were singing in the Yiddish choir that year with Devora. When I first met her, I was just living in New York then, uh, you know, after uh, my time in Tulsa. So so I was uh, there, and uh, we. <laughs> he invited me. He said, would you play Hebrew melody? And so he accompanied me, Zalman did, and... Uh, you and oh, there was again that the father's presence, that this this thing that I experienced in this thing. I'm sorry, this this un, special presence that came uh, of the Ruach Hakodesh. It, it came in the in that auditorium. Same thing, and nobody moved for like a minute. Nobody said anything. We just I, I didn't even want to walk. I didn't want to move. Nobody wanted to move. These are all just, you know, 
choose, you know, but they, I tell you what, they, the, that, there's something in it. So I'm actually, the Lord said, I want you to, to tell that and then play this. And I believe that glory is just going to that same, that same wonderful glory is going to, to come upon us tonight as we say before we receive communion here. So this is Hebrew Melody.
praise the Lord. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, hamotzi lechemin haaretz. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, Ore pri hagafen. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Yeshua, on the night he was betrayed, took the matzah and he broke it. And he said, take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. And I'd like to add, so you may be healed and made whole. We give you shalom, spirit, soul, and body. Be made whole now as you partake. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen. Yeshua took the cup on that Passover after the dinner, and he said, this is my blood. Pour it out for you, for the remission of sin and for the forgiveness of your sins. This is the blood of Messiah, the blood of the everlasting covenant, the new covenant, he says, drink, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Thank you, Lord, for dying in our place. Behold the Passover, behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our shalom was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Hallelujah. He bore our sins. He bore our shame. But he rose again from the dead. He defeated sin and death. Behold, the holy Mashiach, Messiah of Israel, the soon coming king, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Thank you for pouring out your life for us. We do this in remembrance of you. Receive his Zoe eternal life. Wow, wonderful night. It was long, a little long, but I enjoyed it. I want to wish you Shabbat Shalom, dear ones. Thank you for being with me. I hope you got something good out of that tonight. And uh, please keep praying for me so that I can follow the Lord and do what he asked me to do moment by moment. That's what I, and I, I believe that God touched you as well. Praise God. Now may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his shalom peace. Amen. I put God's name upon you. Hallelujah. Now, and may it be honored in your lives, dear ones. In Yeshua's mighty name, be blessed. May the grace of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah, the love of God, and the comfort and the
communion and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be yours now and forever. Remember, I'll be praying for you tonight uh, before I go to bed around 11 or so, 11 to 12 usually is when I, and I'll be lifting up your all of those beautiful hearts. Thank you. Be lifting up your names and uh, before the Lord, blessing those that, that are that are that have posted, and and also if you, any prayer requests that you have, I will agree with you. And if we agree, God, the Lord's in the middle of that. He says, if you shall agree as touching anything in my name, I will do it in the name of Yeshua, the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So. God wants to bless you and supply all your needs. Tomorrow, uh, Lord willing, I'll, we'll, uh, we'll take our spiritual vitamins too, our promise, our healing and prosperity promise. I just, tonight was a, uh, was a, our Jewish night. So I kind of, and I enjoy doing, I enjoy doing that and taking the time to really, to really see the Lord said, he said, it's not just information. You have to, you have to, to actually let God touch your heart for Israel. You, it, this is, it's a revelation. Anything from God is a revelation. It's an unveiling of truth. It's not something that you, you figure out like a math problem. Uh, it's it's a a, it's a, a eureka. God reveals it. <laughs> and uh, and that's true of being born again. It's true with any subject in the Bible, faith or uh, the love of God. Or, you know. Israel, the message of Israel in the Bible, once you see it, then whenever you read it, it just opens up to you because, you, you, because you've been reading and spiritualizing everything for so long, you don't actually see what he's writing there. But once you see that, then, and if you go to Israel too, if you've never been, you need to go because like uh, Governor Mike says, uh, Mike Huckabee, he says, uh, when, when you go to Israel, the Bible goes from black and white to color. <laughs> you know, suddenly it's a real place where real people did real things and we've read about them our whole lives, but it, it actually happened just, uh, you know, and, and it, it, this is... Uh, it, it's a living, uh, it becomes a living, breathing reality. And God will put a love in your heart. And see, let me tell you a secret. The more we love and honor uh, others, God lifts us up. And that's, that's the way it is with the message of Israel too. That when the nations humble themselves under that blessing, then God, under that revelation, God lifts you up into a a whole nother place it's a royal a, a royal thing as is a beautiful you know the whole idea the whole idea of royalty came from our heavenly father that's where it, yeah he's the one that lifted us all up to kings and priests and uh yeah and in heaven they're very it's remember narnia you know king King Peter the Magnificent and King Edmund the Wise, or whatever, King Lucy, you know. Well, that's what God does. And when we've been in that realm in heaven for a while, we won't think like we did on earth anymore. And that's a very, C.S. Lewis did a beautiful, beautiful uh, way of presenting that because righteousness really is that. It's a, it's a whole nother standing where we're in a place and God lifts us up in his grace. Hallelujah. But if he's done, yes, uh, Devorah just wrote, come with us in May. Are we going in May, dear? I guess we're going to Israel. Hallelujah. Well, I, maybe Mike, uh, 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 yeah, he probably set up another tour. We've had to cancel two of them, uh, two or three. Uh, so, yes, and we love... I. I just love to watch, that'll be my 49th trip, isn't that one? I think 49th or 50th, I, to, to ask Devorah, she, she'll remember what I said last night, I think it's 49th. But uh, 
and, or the last one was 49, this is 50. So, but we've had this uh, China virus thing and Israel, uh, we had to cancel two tours. I uh, We go every year with uh, Governor Mike and we have our team and I play and uh, Christian Jewish music. We just have a wonderful time. And But I love watching, I love watching those that the first time they're there and they experience uh, Israel for the first time, and and it is such uh, it is such a supernatural uh, uh, unveiling. Really, it's a revelation, and uh, uh, God's people need this will add to you, not take away. See, a lot of times we think, well, if if we, you know, if we uh, do, you know, what. Well, no, no, we're Israel now. Well, yes and no. You're Israel in the sense that you're, you're, we're in the same family. But, hallelujah, when, let God, let God, uh, let God touch your heart in such a way that you can celebrate it. When you start to celebrate it, that unlocks it. When it's unlocked, then, then, uh, I've seen people, you know, that have been stuck in religious tradition for a long time and their eyes just, they open and they go, oh, so that's what the Bible means. <laughs> and then the spiritual part really opens up. Then you can take your spiritual uh, promise, fear not, I'm with thee, you know, and that's for all of God's people. Yes, hallelujah. All right, I got to get going now, and I'm hungry. I didn't eat any dinner yet, so I'm going <laughs> to... So, I love you. And, uh, oh, remember, uh, please, uh, please, if you can, uh, 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 send a, a donation or an offering. Or, uh, uh, financially, we depend on your you uh, daily for our, uh, this ministry. And so, if... if uh, if that, that would be such a blessing, and if God would have you do that, you can go to um, Sklar Ministries, S K L A R Ministries dot com, and there's a PayPal button there, and I think the information is also at the on on the Facebook page there. If you're watching from YouTube, we're getting a lot. I think we're getting a lot of. I have to go check out all those those two because we we're, we're now. We're now uh, on different platforms, I think. So it's uh, it's expanded, and and that's good because I'm I'm getting really concerned about Facebook and all these high big tech censoring things. I've had just in the last two weeks, I've had several posts about uh, politics or election have been just disappeared, just just they're just gone. Then I couldn't find it. Well, I've had that happen, and so, uh, but I've just, Lord, give us a little more time. <laughs> I think we still, we're not done yet. Good things are happening. I'm going to check into the news again. I didn't watch it today. I have no idea, but there's a lot of court stuff being filed now, so um, I'm interested to see how God's going to do this one, but he'll, he'll do it. <laughs> he always does. <laughs> Amen. Well, I gotta say good night. I love you, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow, uh, Lord willing. And be blessed and Shabbat Shalom. Just worship and rest. Don't just try to, you know. Don't worry. Most of all, just don't, don't fret. Hallelujah. So I play the violin. I'm obeying the Bible. The Bible says, fret not. There's no frets. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> love you, guys. Uh, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Shalom.